Hi everyone, we're so glad you're here with us today. This is our Literacy Leaders for Webinar Series third session, and our topic today will be phonics. All of our resources are linked in the Padlet on this slide, so you can use the bit.ly or the QR code to access the Padlet. And Cynthia will also be dropping a link to the Padlet in our chat bar. So before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our Office of Early Learning team for our webinar series. I'm Kelly Pratt, and I'm one of the early education consultants for the Western region. Presenting with me today is Candace Heath, representing the Southeast region, and behind the scenes helping us man the Q&A and the chat and the polls are Dr. Donna Albaugh from the Sand Hills region, Dr. Angela Preston from the Southwest region, and Cynthia Barber from the Northwest region. And once again, we're going to share our resource Padlet, so the bit.ly's on this slide as well. Um, and we'll drop the note catcher and the Padlet in the link one more time before we get started. We have a large amount of information to present to you today, so you might want to use that note catcher to record your thoughts as we go. So as I said earlier, our focus for today will be phonics. Um, and please be sure if you haven't registered for our remaining two sessions, please go ahead and do that. We will be dropping a link for the flyer to register in the chat bar. And we'll start by taking a quick look at our agenda to kind of preview our content for our time together this morning. Um, unfortunately, our speaker for Perspectives from the Field is unable to join us today due to illness, but we do hope to continue to have speakers join us in future sessions. So today we'll really be starting with evidence-based practices for phonics, and we'll talk about phonics and orthographic mapping. We'll look at some instructional practices like strategies for teaching high-frequency words, using sound walls, and using decodable text. We'll also learn a little bit about code emphasis approaches to instruction versus meaning emphasis approaches to instruction. And then we'll spend some time talking about the role of data in assessing phonics and supporting teachers in effective implementation. Lastly, we'll wrap up with some next steps to prepare for our next session in January. We're going to try and do a couple quick polls again this time. So our first question is, um, what's your role in the district? Because we always want to kind of see who's here to who's here joining us. So we have some district administrators, principals, assistant principals, coaches. Yay. It's really nice to have that broad um, section of folks with you. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to join us today. We're going to do one more poll. Our next poll is going to ask you about how you've been able to use ALF. So we're going to connect back to our learning from last session. Um, have you been able to follow up, follow up with, with ALF? And also, have you had a chance to dig into the Letters PLC guide yet? Okay, it looks like we have a split. We've got some folks who've been able to dig into the ALF, and also we have some folks who've been able to explore um, the PLC gu guides. And I just want to remind you all, as you are um, digging into those processes, that we are here to provide additional support if you all need it. Just shout at your OEL consult. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. Um, and we're really going to start digging into our content now. So the first thing I want to point out on this slide is the little brain with the heart in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. You'll see this in our sessions today when we're talking about theoretical models or the processes of the reading brain. So in our last session, Don and Angela walked us through the importance of phonological awareness. And on this slide, you're seeing an updated hourglass figure that was created by Dr. Carol Tolman, who's one of the authors of letters. So what this image is showing us is how we make connections between the speech sounds that the speech sounds that we hear and the orthography or the written language that we use for reading and writing. So the orange section at the top of the hourglass shows the phoneme awareness activities that individuals um, that involve individual sounds and occur in simple syllables. This is the speech sound part of the model. And then the bottom part of the hourglass is the orthography or the written language. So this section builds in, in complexity from the middle to the bottom of the hourglass it begins with the relationships between the letters and sounds that they represent and builds to understanding complex ideas like how prefixes and suffixes and root words carry meaning and morphology or how word origin can be determined 
when we re read and spell words and think about the etymology or where those words come from. So when children first start making the connections between phonemes or the sounds and graphemes, the letters that represent the, the sounds, they usually start at the single grapheme level that happens right there in the middle of the hourglass. And that connection is known as speech to print. All right, so let's make that connection then from phonological awareness to phonic. And on our next slide, we are going to look at a quote from letters. So in unit three of letters, the authors, Louisa Motes and Carol Tolman say, the goal of phonemic awareness training is to establish the parking spots in which letters in print can be slotted for later recall. So what this quote is really speaking to is that children, especially when they're first beginning to read, they have to be able to recognize and store speech sounds in order to be able to make that speech to print connection. And that speech to print connection, just like we saw in the hourglass, is really where phonics starts coming into play. So if you were with us for our last session, you'll remember that we talked about evidence-based practices for phonological awareness and oral language. Today, we're really gonna focus on what, what science tells us about phonics instruction. So we'll start by digging a little bit deeper into phonics and the connection between letters or graphemes and the spoken sounds or the phonemes that we use in our language. And you have seen Scarborough's rope and the simple view of reading on multiple occasions now. So we're just going to use them briefly as a framework for today's content. We know that the reading rope identifies both of the critical components of language comprehension and word recognition. So we'll be looking more at language comprehension strands in our upcoming sessions. And today we're going to continue to really focus on word recognition. During today's session, we're going to drill down and look at decoding, which is the ability to read words or to translate a word from print to speech by using those sound symbol relationships. We'll also be talking about sight recognition of familiar words. So this includes both regularly and irregularly spelled words that a student has built enough automaticity with that they can recognize those words immediately and effortlessly. So how do we define phonics? The term phonics can be used in a couple different ways. We typically think about phonics being the strategy that we use to teach the connection between sounds and letters, but the definition of phonics goes a little bit deeper than that. So phonics is not just the strategy that we use to provide instruction, it's also the system that represents the interconnectedness of sounds and symbols for reading and writing. And it's also one of the essential five components for effective literacy instruction. But really the most important thing that you need to know about phonics is that there's no longer any debate among reading scientists about its importance to effective reading instruction in order to provide a critical advantage for most students. This is fun, I'm excited about this, y'all. So um, I'm sure you have heard people talk about English being crazy or like you've seen the memes on the internet about English being crazy because there are just so many exceptions to the rule. You're gonna see Donna's just launched our poll um, in our sidebar. We have three questions in that poll about how crazy English really is. So we're gonna give you a minute to respond to those poll questions. All right, so let's work through this. What percentage of the English language can be spelled accurately just by knowing the sound symbol correspondences? We, I see um, some 25s, I see a lot of 50s and 75s. Let's click it in and see what the answer is. So about 50% of the English language can be spelled accurately just using knowledge of sound symbol um, correspondences. So just by sounding them out, right? We'll go to question number three, about what percent of words are identifiable based on etymology or word origin, that's 10%. And then hopefully our last click is going to fade us out. Maybe it won't. And if it doesn't, I will just tell you. An additional 36% of words in the English language can be spelled accurately, except for one speech sound. And so the big takeaway on this slide, y'all, is that when you add all of that up, Really, only about 4% of the words in the English language really are truly irregular, and they don't fit any explainable pattern. Moving on to word predictability, 
one of the things that we think about when we think about regularity and, and irregularity with words is that the way we learned words is either words were regular and you could sound them out or words were irregular um, and you couldn't sound them out. But what we know now is that words continue on a range of predictability. Um, so words can be completely regular, they can be somewhat irregular, or they can be mostly irregular. And the thing to think about is even if a word is somewhat irregular and a student can't sound out most of the word, um, if they can even sound out parts of the word, that limits what they have to hold in their memory alone. So we're gonna look at a couple words, and I think you might've gotten a preview, but that's okay. We're gonna look at a couple words and think about where they would fall on the scale of predict predictability. So I'm gonna say a word, and I'm gonna give you a minute to think, a few seconds to think about where that word would fit on this chart, and then we'll click in the word so you can check your thinking. So our first word is snip, snip, like I snip with a pair of scissors. Do you think that would be regular, somewhat irregular, or mostly irregular? Let's go ahead and click that in and see where it falls. Okay, yep, snip is regular because all of the sounds in the word snip they make, or all of the letters in the word snip, they make the sound that they would we would expect them to make. The next word on our list is the word colonel, like a colonel in the army. So when you hear that word colonel, do you think that word is regular, somewhat irregular, or mostly irregular? All right, cross your fingers, let's click it in. Good, so kernel falls in that mostly irregular category. So if you think about it, kernel is a seven letter word, but of the seven letters in that word, only three actually make the sound that we would expect them to make. Um, and this is one of those places where etymology can help you out because kernel actually comes from a French word, coronel, don't mind my pronunciation, um, which means a commander of a regiment of soldiers. So that kind of helps us explain some of that irregular spelling. We have one more word that we're going to click in. Our last word is most, like I need the most chocolate. And so thinking about that word most, is that going to be regular? Is it gonna be somewhat irregular or is it gonna be mostly irregular? And let's go ahead and click most in. And most falls into that somewhat irregular category because based on the rules we know about English language, we would usually expect the vowel sound in most to be a short vowel sound because it's in a closed syllable. But in this case, it makes that long vowel sound. So of the, word, of the letters in the word most, um, out of the four letters, three of them are decodable. And one of them you have to remember makes a sound that's a little bit different than what you would expect. So we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about syllable types. Um, I think syllable types are a lot of fun and where you get a lot of bang for your buck because we often think about, um, in phonics, we often think about phonics teaching letter sound associations to small children. But just like um, Tolman's Hourglass showed us, phonics instruction is really also helps teach complex skills that are needed for reading and spelling. And so there are six syllable types that we really need to explicitly teach to students because teaching syllable types helps students determine and remember what vowel sound a syllable will make. And it also helps children be able to read and spell more complex words. So the chart that we have here explains and gives examples um, with visuals of popular candy labels um, that match the syllable types. Something to think about when we're using this chart is that you wouldn't use this chart to teach all of the syllable types at once to students. Each syllable type really needs to be taught explicitly um, with practice for mastery. And you wouldn't necessarily teach them in this order. Our syllables are organized in this order because it makes the mnemonic device clover. But typically when you teach syllables to children, you usually start with closed syllables, then move to open syllables, and then move to consonant vowel E or magic E syllables. This chart and the mnemonic device clover are ways to remember all of the six syllable types. So we're gonna run through them all pretty quickly. Our first syllable type is a closed syllable and it ends in one or more consonant letters. And what those consonants do is they close in the vowel sound 
and they make it a short vowel sound. And so we can see an example of closed syllables in the words milk dud, because both milk and dud, the words end in consonant letters that close in the vowel sounds and keep the vowel sounds short. The next syllable type on our list is consonant LE. And consonant LE is a kind of interesting syllable because it can't stand alone. It has to be connected to another syllable type. Um, when I first learned consonant LE, the rule to help me divide that syllable is when you have a consonant LE, you count back three, and that's where you divide the syllable. And so in our words, Skittles, if we look at Skittle and can look at the consonant LE and we count back three, we have our first syllable of skit and our second syllable of tolls. Our next syllable type on our chart is open syllables. Um, and open syllables end in a vowel sound. So if you think of about closed syllables, the consonant, the vowel sound being closed in by consonants, in open syllables, there's no consonant to shut the door on them. So the open syllables can say their long vowel sound. And you see that represented in the candy name of row low. You have those long vowel sounds. Our next syllable type is, I think, the, the most tricky syllable type, and it's our vowel teams. Vowel teams are groups of vowels that work together to make a single sound. What makes it a little bit tricky is it's not always a long sound and it's not always a short sound. They're variable sounds. And so you can see examples of a vowel team in our Reese's candy wrapper because that double E vowel team makes the long E sound. And then we'll move on to magic E, sometimes called silent E, sometimes called consonant vowel E. Um, and this pattern, we end our word with a consonant and our silent E, which then goes back and makes that vowel sound long, like in the words Mike and Ike that both have the long vowel sound. And finally, we have R controlled vowels, which might be my favorite, um, R controlled syllables, which might be my favorite syllable um, because the R changes the vowel sound and distort, distorts the sound. Sometimes these syllables are called the bossy R syllables because they change the sound of the vowel. So you can see in the word starburst, the R makes the A vowel say R and the R makes the U vowel say er. So like I said, syllable types are, are really fun to teach, but they're also really important for helping students be able to decode um, and spell more complex multi-syllable words. Now that we have a little bit of the background around phonics, we're gonna take a look at a sample lesson plan to guide phonics instruction. And we're also gonna reference this lesson plan as we work through some of the content that we're looking at today. The sample lesson plan on this slide, it's just a template. It's not a script. It gives you an overview of the components that should be included for students in core instruction. It doesn't have, have to happen all at the same time. It can be delivered in whole group or small group instruction based on the developmental appropriateness and student need. However, you should be able to see all of these components um, in daily instruction. So when you look at the template, you can see that we start by stating our purpose and looking at our outcomes. And then during the practice session, we would be practicing activities like focusing on, on or listening to or manipulating sounds and words for phonemic awareness practice. We might look at drilling for fluency or rereading a text or practicing concepts that we've already taught. During modeling, this is where the teacher would provide direct and explicit instruction for new concepts. This is really where the I do part of explicit instruction occurs. During guided practice, the teacher is going to lead practice of those new skills that students are learning. So this is that we do part of explicit instruction and it can include using new letter sounds, spellings and words. It can include practicing dictation. In just a minute, we're gonna look at a phoneme grapheme mapping activity, which is another example of something that could happen in guided practice. And then during independent practice or the you do component of explicit instruction, this is where you would see kids practicing the skills that they have been learning in decodable text and making relationships to this, the sound spelling connections within text. This is a, um, a simplified version, 
of a lesson plan that's also referenced in the teacher's letters curriculum. This is a quick video that gives us a look at what guided practice um, in the sample phonics lesson plan might look like. The video does start with a few seconds of silence at the beginning, so if you're questioning whether your volume's working, it probably is. And what you're gonna be seeing is a small group of students working on a phoneme graphing mapping activity. While you're watching, I want you to look for a couple things. I want you to look and see, can you tell what the teacher's doing to reinforce phonemic awareness um, before adding graphemes? And I also want you to think about how the teacher is providing feedback to students and then how the teacher is reinforcing that letter sound connection. So let's take a look. So let's start with the word how. Now, don't do anything yet. I want you to think about how many sounds you hear in the word how. So let's see if we can hear it. Ready? How many sounds? Three. Three. So what we're going to do is we're going to move a chip into three boxes, just like this. And then with your marker, we're just going to cross out the last two boxes so we don't feel like we need to use them. We're going to write the letters that represent those sounds. So what was our first sound in the word cap? What was it? Chief. Well, the sound. Oh. Good, but you knew that we were going to put what letter in that box? C. C. All right, so we're going to move our chip up, and then we're going to write the C. Um, let's move our second chip up, and what is that second sound? Mm -hmm. uh, and what letter are we going to write in there? A. A. All right, so let's write an A. And then what was the last sound? And what letter are we going to write there? P. Great. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to review the sound. So let's go. Let's let's touch the boxes as we say the sounds. Ready? Cat. 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 Now let's spell it. Ready? C A E. Cat. Write it on the line. So hopefully a couple things that you picked out while watching the video is we did see the teacher say and tap the sounds first, making that connection back to phonemic awareness before connecting the sounds to the graphemes that represent them. And then one of the things about the feedback the teacher provides is she catches when the student says the name of the letter C and she holds her hand up to her ear and kind of prompts the student to make the sound, but she also goes back and acknowledges the fact that that student did know the, the letter that represents the sound. So he was on it. He was just a little too on. It. And then the teacher reinforces that letter sound connection by providing multiple opportunities to hear the sound, map the sound, and then write the sound. We are going to take a look on our next slide at a little bit bigger picture of phoneme graphing mapping. So in session two, we talked about using Elkhorn inboxes to help students segment words into phonemes. So I wanna make sure we note the difference between Elkhorn boxes and the orthographic mapping grid. So Elkhorn boxes are used to identify sounds and to segment and blend sounds within spoken language. So we're still just working with sound. In phoneme graphing mapping, this technique is used to show how the sound actually does map to the letter or letter groups that make the sounds. And it teaches the logic of English orthography of orthography in an explicit, sequential, and systematic manner. So in the video, you saw students segmenting the sounds and words and moving the chips into boxes after they say the phonemes, and then writing the graphemes that represent the letter or letter combination. So this slide is giving us some, some more complex spelling patterns and what those would look like with phoneme grapheme mapping. So you can see each box still represents a single sound, but as students are taught the relationships they learn that more than one letter may represent the sound. The word night on this sheet is a really good example of that because we can look in the first box and see that the letters K, N are mapped in that first box. So together those sounds represent the N sound. IGH is mapped in the second box and those letters are being used to represent the, the 
I sound. And then T is being mapped in the last box to represent the T sound. Another thing that we can look at on this chart is the way that we would map a silent E word. So if you look at the word rude, you can see that silent E is mapped in the same box as the letter D or the D sound. And this is because it doesn't make a sound on its own. But the action of that silent E on the vowel, making it a long vowel sound, is shown by drawing an arrow between the crossed out silent E back to the vowel to show the impact of the long U sound in rude. And then let's look at one more before we go on. Let's look at tax. In the word tax, you're gonna see the letter X is written between two boxes. And what this shows is that X actually represents two sounds, the K sound and the S sound. So even though tax is represented by three letters, T-A-X, it actually has four sounds, T, A, K, S. And that X divides, divided between the two boxes is showing us that sound representation. Now, like the syllable chart, this is just an example of how to illustrate more complex spelling patterns. With students, you would wanna make sure that you're only practicing patterns that they've been expl explicitly taught. So they're not attempting to use invented spelling. And you also wanna make sure that you're making the connection between the sounds that the students hear and the letters or the letter or letters that represent those sounds. Because using this opportunity, using this activity with students is an opportunity to reinforce the concepts that they've already been working on. All right. So Kelly just finished sharing with us a phoneme graphy mapping. So another term that you're going to often hear associated with, associated with phonics is orthographic mapping. So we just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the difference between these terms. And um, let's start by taking a look at def a definition of what orthographic mapping is. So orthographic mapping is a process by which students use the oral language processing part of their brain, which we'll talk about in just a second, to map or connect the sounds of words that they already know, which are those phonemes, to the letters in a word, their spellings, and then they permanently store those connected sounds and letters of words along with their meaning as instantly recognizable words. And sometimes we call this recognizing them as if we're reading them by sight or a sight vocabulary. So let's take a look at our reading brain. During our first session, um, Angela and Donna talked a little bit about the reading brain. So if you guys remember reading, we've studied and we've learned through research that reading occurs on our, the left side of our brain. So on that left side, you'll see this image here. There's a lot going on, but the most important two areas to remember are that back part of our brain, occipital lobe and the frontal. So when we see words on print on page, the first thing our, our brain does is it sends a signal back here to the back of our brain, our occipital lobe. And right there in that part of, part of our brain, we determine is that um, a squiggly line? Is it a straight line? Is that a letter I recognize? And then there's a signal sent back to the front of our brain, that frontal lobe. And that's where pronunciation, articulation, um, where phonemes come into play. And we form this circuitry or this pathway in our brain that eventually leads to storage or in our visual word form area. And we call that orthographically mapped words. So we store them as if we've memorized them by sight. And that's that little circle down at the bottom, the orange part. So we're gonna take a second. We're gonna watch a video um, that explains orthographic mapping a little bit more detail. And I'd like for you to listen in for that effortless retrieval that they describe. It's not memorizing words with flashcards. It's that mental process in our brain where we store those words for that immediate and effort, effortless retrieval. Orthographic mapping. How do children become fluent readers and writers? Well, it starts with the sight word vocabulary. This doesn't mean though that they should be given a set of sight words to memorize. That's inefficient and it doesn't help them spell those words later. Instead, they build up a store of words they can recognize effortlessly without sending them out and without looking elsewhere for cues. In fact, once they have a word in their sight word vocabulary, they can't suppress its sound and possible meanings when they come to that word again. So saying that children shouldn't learn whole words for memorization sounds counterintuitive. And in fact, I have to apologize when I ask teachers not to do this because many of them spend hours and years even sending home sight words for memorization with the best intentions. But please don't shoot the messenger. 
A popular thought is that input and output should be equal. So we speak in whole words. Why not input whole words? I'm afraid that doesn't work. Let's break it down and put it into perspective. As a literate adult, how many words and word parts do you think you might instantly recognise? Kilpatrick puts it as somewhere between 30 and 70,000. Now, my question to you is, did you consciously memorise each one as a whole? Or did you store them in a different way? It would be impossible to consciously memorise this many words. What you actually did was use a process called orthographic mapping. Let's break it down. Ortho means correct or straight, such as in orthodontist or orthopaedic. Graph, that which is written. And mapping, matching one representation to another. This diagram is intended to show the relationship between orthography, the spelling of something, M-A-P-P-I-N-G, and how that maps onto phonology, m a p i n g, and then how that's stored in the lexicon, mapping. Here's the process. What you do is you look at the sequence of the letters in a word, then you translate them into possible phonemes when you're reading, you blend those phonemes to form words, and then through exposure, those sequences become unitized, leading to instant recognition. Some estimates put it at one to four exposures for typically developing readers. This in turn facilitates recall when writing. All right. So when I first watched this video, the big aha for me was the 30 to 70,000 words that as adults we've orthographically mapped. And yet we did not have flashcards for all of those words. So that was a, a pretty powerful statement for me. If you would like to watch the rest of the video, we'll have all of our videos linked on the Padlet and you can watch the remaining portion. It's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, so moving along, um, until, recently, we, whoops. until recently we thought we stored words as those whole visual images, almost like snapshots of words in our brain. But the chart at the top is our old way of thinking. We used to think we saw that written word, our visual vocabulary was activated and then we just retrieved, our, re retrieved it from memory. But we've realized through Aries theory of orthographic mapping that we actually have this efficient oral and mental filing system. And we know this because the speed in which we're able to hear and recognize the sounds in oral language and that orthographic mapping process of connecting those sounds that come so natural to us to those visual representations allows us to um, store them in our brains. And that phoneme graphing mapping that Kelly mentioned a minute ago is that connection that we make between the sounds and the letters that build our automaticity that's necessary for orthographic mapping. So the more we process words, we build this large bank of familiar words that we recognize automatically, that 30 to 70,000 as adults, not because we're memorizing the words, but because we have stored them in our visual word form area of our brain. So let's take a little example of that, and we're going to practice an activity um, I'm going to have you guys take a look at these colors that are on the screen and just name the color, not the word. Okay, now try reading the words. When we look at letters and we look at the colors, they're both visual activities. However, as a, a proficient reader, your brain probably automatically mapped those familiar letters or letter combinations for the words blue and yellow and black and green. And it was probably a little bit difficult for you to first name that color because you have orthographically stored those words in your brain. So to see blue as a yellow color, that was probably a little bit difficult. So let's take a look at the next example where the colors actually match the words. Now read the color. And now read the words. And hopefully that was a lot quicker and easier. In this case, your brain was able to align that automatic mapping of the word and the meaning to the corresponding color, therefore making that whole process more automatic. And that's what we're working toward. So over the next few slides, we're going to talk about the difference between the terms sight words and high frequency words, because sometimes those terms are often confused and interchanged, which actually they're, they're two very different terms that we should be using in our classrooms. All right, so sight words, as we've talked about already, are those words that we have stored in our brains as in memory, as if by sight. We recognize them automatically and immediately without decoding. High frequency words are the most common words in English language. And sometimes, they, like I mentioned, those words are interchanged. We might say we have a sight word list, 
but truly it's probably a high frequency word list. And some of those high frequency words might have regular decodable patterns, like we mentioned earlier when Kelly was describing those, and some are very irregular and have some decodable portions, but other portions that have to be taught explicitly. So we're gonna talk through um, how we might teach those irregular high frequency words and some strategies that we could use in the classroom. All right, so in order for a high frequency word to become a sight word, we have to have some strategic instruction. Here are some examples here. Um, there are actually research-based techniques that help our students learn those tricky words that don't involve just flashcard memorization because we've learned that that's not really effective. Um, sometimes teachers call those irregular patterns heart words or a heart portion because they have to learn that portion as if by heart or memorization, but only a small part. So you see that example, the heart on that little Elkonin box is just one portion. Um, brain science has revealed to us that readers actually do examine every letter and, and print on a page when we're reading words. Sometimes it just happens so quickly uh, that it feels like we read them like a whole word, but we've learned that that's not true. We have that large bank of sight words that we've, we've stored in our brain. Um, as teachers, when we're starting to introduce these irregular words, it's important that we only introduce a few words at a time and we group similar words together by pattern and use multi-sensory techniques as much as possible. So on the next slide, we're gonna show you just a few minutes of a technique called teaching heart words. And this can vary. This is just one form of the heart word strategy, but I would like for you to take a look at how this teacher, these examples in this video, what portion of the word they determined was tricky or the heart portion, and notice how they don't focus on the whole word unit. Instead, they're noting just the regular spelled portion or the phonetic portion, and the irregular portion as if by heart or by memory. Let's examine the word is, as in, Jose is taller than me. Let's see if we can figure out which parts of is we know and which parts we have to learn by heart. Is has two sounds, is. The first sound, i, short i, is spelled with the letter i. We can read this part using our phonics knowledge. The last sound, is spelled with the letter S. Sometimes the letter S spells Z instead of the S sound we expect. This is the one part we have to know by heart. We might see the word is in different shapes, colors, and sizes. Is, 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 is. These all have the same letters and they all say is. Now let's see if you can remember how to spell the word is. 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 We can use our phonics knowledge to spell the first sound. The first sound is short I. I. How do we spell I? You've got it. The letter I. The second sound is the part we have to learn by heart. Do you remember how to spell Z in this word? Yes. We use the letter S. I S is. S spells Z in lots of other common words too, like his, has, and was. This is important to remember when we are learning to read. Remembering heart words is easier when we know there is just one part to learn by heart. And like I mentioned, there are other variations of the heart word strategy. And sometimes the heart part of the word will change based on grade level. Once students know that, that the S can represent multiple sounds, it could say S or Z, then it's no longer a heart. And instead that word is and that words that are similar are then stored in that visual word form area. Okay, so let's switch gears and we'll talk about another essential literacy classroom tool that you might use with our earliest readers um, for, in classrooms for phonics instruction and phonemic awareness, and those are sound walls. We learned in our last webinar, there are you know, 26 letters in English, yet there are 44 phonemes or sounds that represent those and 240 different ways to represent those sounds. Hence the need for explicit phonics instruction, and sound walls are going to help to um, make that connection from speech to print in the classroom. So you may be more familiar with the term word wall. They've been a staple in classroom for years. However, sound walls are a little bit different because they focus on decoding skills rather than that alphabetic A to Z list of um, high frequency words. So let's take a minute to take a look at what they would look like in a classroom and how they might be helpful and useful. 
All right, so if you see on these two sample photographs, sound walls don't have that A to Z format. They look very different. Um, they're organized by those 44 speech sounds in English. If you look on the far left side, that's a consonant sound wall. And if you look to the far right, that's a vowel valley sound wall. And you'll notice there's a clip art image in the middle and that's just of a mirror. We learned in our last webinar, it's so important for students to be able to visualize that correct mouth formation of sounds, the articulation. Um, so for example, letters P and B, the sounds and how to represent those letters are often confused by students. If I make those sounds now, um, if you'll watch my lips, they look very much the same. P and P. And so hence the reason that students get very confused. If I hold my hand in front of my mouth as I make those sounds, P and P. it even feels the same. It's one puff of air. It's a stopped consonant sound. However, if I place my hand right on my sound box right here, or my voice box, I can hear a change. P and B. Feel free to try that yourself. There's a vibration that I felt with the letter or the sound. B. And that's where consonant walls would come into play. It's very tiny. It's hard for you to see. But P and B, the sounds for both of those, would be right there together. Um, they're both stopped sounds. However, one is voiced and one is unvoiced. And this is just one example of how a sound wall might help students um, as they're learning these articulatory features and also the differences, small, slight differences between sounds. So speaking is very natural to students. Students and babies start talking immediately as they're immersed in English. However, reading is not natural. So they have to have this explicit instruction to be able to hear those individual phonemes in the language and also be able to produce those in words. So sound walls help our students recognize that mouth formation, how to produce those sounds. They connect the speech to print because the letters are, are there too. And they orthographically map those words, if you think about our brain again. So the more we can build the knowledge of the graphene and phoneme system, the more we provide that glue for connecting speech to print and memory. All right, so why sound walls? So sound walls are gonna support reading, decoding, and spelling, encoding to make those connections. And one thing that you might see when you see these in classrooms, if you're walking through, or maybe you are a classroom teacher, you'll see that each card is gonna represent a phoneme and sometimes they're covered. So you might see either a sticky note on the board or you might see that maybe there's a blank area. So as teachers teach a new concept and they add the graphemes to the sound wall, they add them as they teach them. So we don't want to add things on there that student will confuse students or um, may cause a misconception. So as they're introduced, they're added. And they support students with the existing phonics curriculum. So direct application of concepts with continuous practice of phoneme and grapheme mapping. So if you're thinking back to the sample lesson plan that Kelly shared earlier with phonics, Sound walls fit in multiple areas of the lesson plan, but however, I would say they're most powerful in that practice and modeling section. Um, you'll see that students will begin to use sound walls independently. They become just a part of the natural process of a reading block. When students are writing, when they're reading, you'll see they'll just stand up and go over to the sound wall because it's something that's familiar to them that they can reference, and it's just an integral part of a classroom routine. All right, so moving along, let's talk about text for beginning readers. So in our schools and in our classrooms, we have a wide range of text currently available. So we want to talk, take a few minutes to talk about the difference in the types of text that you might see and the purpose for each type. All right, so typically beginning reader text can be classified into one of these four categories. And oftentimes there is an overlap. Um, you might say like, well, it kind of fits this category in this category, and, and that's normal. Um, so the differences between these, the first one is high frequency text and high frequency text is just like it sounds. It's going to focus on those high frequency words with little regard to sound symbol correspondences. It's going to be more visual memory of the high fre frequency words within text. Predictable text is going to have predictable patterns just like it sounds and it's going to usually have pictures to support those unknown words. So when they get to the unknown word, they usually can check the picture and complete the sentence. A leveled reader or leveled text um, is kind of a mix between high frequency and predictable. It's based on that A to Z scale. Um, for our early readers, they don't typically follow any kind of phonic, phonics patterns or scope and sequence for decoding, and don't often have uh, cumulative practice for phonics skills. 
at the earliest level, there's heavy dependence on picture support for those unknown words. And their primary focus is going to be on language comprehension, that top portion of the reading rope. And then, of course, decodable text is used um, for phonics. It's going to follow that spelling pattern, scope, and sequence. It's going to um, have heavy dependence on the alphabetic code rather than memorization or guesswork. The primary focus is decoding, and that's going to be that bottom portion of our reading rope. In the next few slides, we're going to talk a little bit more about decodable text, what to look for in the classroom, and also some sample lesson plans. So why decodable? Um, decodable texts have been around a very long time since the publication of the National Reading Panel in 2000. Many districts um, purchase decodables. They begin using systematic phonics. They have had that set scope and sequence from simple to increasingly complex skills. And it's just an evidence-based way to build those pathways in our brain that allow students to recognize words as if by sight automatically with very little effort. And decodable texts are going to provide that opportunity for practice and application of the phonic skills in a connected text. If you would like to hear a little bit more about the differences between leveled readers and decodables, um, our Office of Early Learning had a webinar last January that's going to be hyperlinked right here. Um, and it goes into much more detail about the differences between the two and the purpose for each. So if we go back to our sample lesson plan again for phonics, you would probably see a decodable occurring right at the end of the lesson in that independent practice time. Um, sometimes this is done as a whole group decodable or decodable passage. And sometimes this is in a small group setting. So let's talk about what it might look like in whole group versus small group. So in whole group, it's still going to be aligned to your phonics scope and sequence. It's going to provide all students with those opportunities to access grade level material. And the difference of small group is that you're going to group your students not by reading level, like ABC, not that level, but by foundational skill need. And at that point, that's where you bring your decodable text in that's going to be connected to your phonics work and a part of that small group time. So if you're trying to process like when would decodables um, occur, like what does that routine look like, we've hyperlinked in the bottom right corner um, some sample instructional routines and the, the decodable reader routine is going to be in Appendix B. And this is also going to be on our Padlet. All right, so let's take a look at what a decodable might look like in kindergarten. So this is a kindergarten example. If you take a quick look, this text seems very simple and somewhat predictable in pattern. However, if you look at the lesson plan guide to the right side, you'll notice that in order to read this text, students had to have knowledge of multiple vowel and consonant sounds and spellings, along with four and five letter words. They had to have possession, contractions, punctuation, and in this particular lesson, there was a strategic focus on z, as in has. If you remember our heart word earlier, there's a connection here. So in an effort to align with the kindergarten phonics scope and sequence, this decodable was strategically selected. And that's the most important part of decodables. They're strategically selected to extend instruction and apply what they learned about letters, sounds, and spellings in books and texts that they can read. We want them to be very successful in this reading. All right, in contrast, in a second grade classroom, a decodable reader might look very different. Um, if you notice to the right side, in order to be successful with this text, the students had to have extensive background in numerous vowel and consonant sounds and spellings, lots of tricky words. Um, they are reinforcing those phonic skills that students already know and also continuing to build fluency. And the long list on that bottom right corner are gradual skills that are introduced or added to the text to increase those opportunities for practice with letter sound correspondences. So we're gonna watch just a couple of minutes of a small group phonics lesson, and we're only gonna play the, the final half of it. So before you see this section, I just wanna show you what happened before. Um, the teacher had already reviewed EE -E and EA as spellings for long E. They've already read some words in isolation, and they're noting the long E within each word. And the portion that you're gonna see is just when the decodable text is being used. This is the first reading, so they are doing a choral read. And the purpose of choral reading on that first read is for students to hear a fluent reader. And the teacher's gonna note specific needs for decoding. So what words did you find in the story that had the E-A or the E-E? Addison, what did you find? Um, I found C. 
I saw easy, so, on most of the babies. Good. Easy is one word. Tree. Trees. Easy. See. There's one more that we haven't said yet. Uh. You can look through and see. Easy, easy see, tree. Aspen? Uh, I forgot. I just, here. Here is in there, too. So we're going to read this book, and before we do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It's about birds that live in the tree. That's why it's called Up in the Trees. There's going to be three different birds. This bird is a crow. This one is a woodpecker. And then that's owl. And so the book is going to tell you about the um, birds in the trees. So we're going to read it together first. So let's open up. Yeah, let's read the title first. That's the thing. Up in the trees. Let's start together. Some, Some birds are easy to hear, but hard to see. Owls are easy to hear, but hard to see at night. All right, so as you guys saw, they were choral reading. They would probably choose to reread this text the following day or in future small group lessons, and they might have students read independently the next day with a buddy or even echo read. So like I mentioned, we are going to link some decodable protocol, sample protocols to our Padlet. So if you're interested in like, what does this look like? What does day one, day two, day three look like? We'll have those examples for you linked within there. Okay, so we are going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the difference between code emphasis and meaning emphasis. Um, we said earlier, one thing that science agree on is that um, an approach with an emphasis on phonics or a code emphasis is an essential part of the instruction. And we know if we neglect this critical instruction and just focus on a meaning emphasis or a literature, or, or a literature approach, we're putting a large percentage of our students um, at a disadvantage. So, in letters, Motes and Tolman outline the contrast in these approaches, and they do have some similar components, and they are likely to address most of the components of the reading rope, but they differ significantly. So we're just going to walk quickly through some of those differences. So when we look at organization, a meaning emphasis approach, most of the class time is spent on reading for meaning. And if there's a phonics or a phonemic awareness instruction, it's incidental. While in code emphasis, the scope and sequence for phonics is used to ensure that new word reading skills are taught in a sequential and systematic manner. When we look at text for meaning and literature emphasis, students are given leveled texts that are based on a reading um, scale from A to Z. And the text is heavily reliant on picture cues and pattern text. Whereas in a code emphasis approach, Students are given decodable text that's connected to the word reading skills that they've already been taught. And then with feedback, when you think about a meaning emphasis approach, students are prompted to use MSVQs instead of attending to individual sounds and words. Whereas in code emphasis, students are prompted to look at the word carefully first and then to sound out the word before checking to see if the meaning makes sense in the sentence. We're going to go on and look at a couple more components. When we look at instructional time, meaning emphasis, the, the time is really focused on building language comprehension skills through activities like shared reading and guided reading. Whereas in a code emphasis, time is divided up to provide about half of the time for word work, especially in K-1, and the other half on oral language and oral reading to build language comprehension skills. When we look at the teacher role in um, a meaning emphasis approach, it's really more about providing um, opportunities for student directed learning and independent reading selections and independent learning sec um, centers versus in a code emphasis, teachers are leading that explicit I do, you do, I do, we do, you do format um, and providing opportunities for guided practice or new learning. And then when we look at the content in meaning emphasis, the content is heavily centered on that creating meaning from text with shared reading and guided reading and leveled books. Whereas in code emphasis, all five of the essential components for reading instruction 
are really accounted for, including opportunities for students to interact with decodable text. So really quickly, we're gonna walk through some quick examples of code emphasis or meaning emphasis. So if we walk into a classroom and we see a small group working on phoneme graphing mapping, that's gonna be an example of code emphasis. And we're gonna represent that with a CE. If I go into a classroom and I observe a guided reading group in kindergarten reading a level C book, that's going to be an example of meaning emphasis. The majority of the reading block was spent in whole group and shared classroom read aloud instruction. That's going to be an example of a meaning emphasis approach. And if I go in and I observe students using a mirror to practice the sounds, um, the movement of their mouths while they're making the sounds, that's going to be a code emphasis approach. So those are some just some quick examples about how those might look different in the classroom. And so now we're going to just walk through what the impact on students. So when we think about student-directed curriculum with a meaning focus, and it sounds appealing at first glance, and it's something that we've really done for a long time, but when we put ourselves in the shoes of a struggling reader, who hasn't had explicit word recognition instruction, um, it can be challenging. So the passage that we have here is a second grade CKLA fluency passage. And this would show you what it would be like for a student to be extracting meaning from a passage that they can only read with about 70% accuracy. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to think about the words you would use to fill in the blank. And then when the 30 seconds is up, I just want you to think about how you would feel reading this passage. Now, I, I don't think our chat is gonna chat to everyone, but if you would, if you want to drop a, a word into the chat about how you're feeling reading this passage with 70% accuracy, um, if everybody can't see them, I might be able to even just narrate them just a little bit. How did that passage make you guys feel? Lost is a common response, you all. Yeah, yeah, and so really the point here is if when we don't give kids that opportunity to have that solid foundation, right, in being able to decode text, and we're just trying to teach them to extract meaning, we really are putting them at a huge disadvantage. We're gonna look at another example at 90% accuracy, which sounds pretty darn good. So I want you to do the same thing. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to kind of think about how you would fill in those blanks. Um, and then I'll have you drop in the chat how you're feeling now. Okay, how are you feeling now at 90%? Is it feeling better? Are you still feeling pretty concerned if you had to answer questions on this passage? Confident, still a little concerned. Better prepared, but still concerned about comprehension. I need more, still concerned. You guys are amazing. Mm -hmm. Thanks y'all, better. Yep. I'm concerned still, Shelly, I hear you, girl, I know you. So e even with 90% even with accuracy, like you definitely feel a little bit more confident about the text, but if someone was asking you comprehension questions, you might struggle to answer them. So our, our next slide just quickly kind of fills in the blank so you can see the total content of the text. And really it does stress the importance of really helping our kids be able to decode words in addition to building meaning. We have to have all of those pieces in place and we can't just concentrate on extracting meaning, which is what we've kind of historically done. Our next slide is a quick comparison of the three queuing system versus cognitive science. And you're going to see this is essentially a summary of what we just said with the meaning-based approach lining up with kind of our three queuing system model that, that we're used to using in our practice versus what a code-based approach tells us or what cognitive science tells us about the, way, the best way to support students with reading instruction. I'm gonna quickly walk us through the four-part processing model for word recognition, which is another way to think about supporting students in reading words. And so this process starts when a student sees a word, right? So they're gonna see the word on the page, and when they see that word, their orthographic processor is going to absorb that visual information and they're going to recognize those letters B, 
B-A-T. Then the orthographic processor is going to communicate, like Candace was talking about, with the phonological processor through the pathway that's built as students engage in systematic, in systematic phonics. And they're going to recognize the sounds b, a, t. Once they recognize the familiar sounds, the meaning processor is engaged, and all of the meanings that they can think of for that word bat pop up in their little brains. What kind of bat is it? Is it a baseball bat? Is it a mammal bat? Is it a guy up to bat? And once they have all those meanings in their heads, then they're going to go to that context processor and look at the words surrounding the word that they're recognizing. The bat has wings and flies. Oh, now I recognize that this is the mammal bat and I've extracted meaning from this text. Dr. David Kilpatrick says it the best way I think anybody could. If you just ask students to pay attention to the first letter or look at the picture um, and look at the context and you're not having them decode the words, we're drawing their attention away from the thing that they have to do, not only to be able to read the word, but also to be able to remember the word. We're gonna move on to our effective implementation. Last time we focused on coaching and professional development and PLC support, but today we're really gonna touch base with um, data for assessing phonics and recognizing effective instruction to support teachers. This is a quick excerpt from letters talking about the most important variable in our in our um, instruction is really looking at our core instruction for our K-3 students. We know if we have a healthy core, about 80% of our students are gonna be at benchmark, but we also need to know what to do when we, when we have students who are not where they need to be. And that's what these questions speak to. We also need to think about this as being an ongoing process because as instructional leaders in your building, you have to have a plan for using data to clearly identify if your instruction is working for students and if it's not, what your next steps will be. So Donna just shared a quick poll and we would like to know which of those M-class assessments measure phonics specifically. So take a minute and answer that poll and then we'll share those answers back with you. Okay, I think maybe we might be a little bit unsure on this, on this um, poll, which is actually good because I really wanted to walk through the assessments with you really quickly. We're actually going to look at which assessments and dibbles really assess phonics skills. So we're going to start with um, nonsense word fluency. And nonsense word fluency, it really generates two scores. So what it does is students get um, a list like you can see with nonsense words, and they get a score for correct letter sounds. So for example, with the word neg, if they sound out n, e, g correctly, they would get a point for each sound. That would be the correct letter sequence, the correct letter sound score. If they read the whole word correctly, neg, that would be the word recoded correctly for score. So the correct letter sounds kind of give you some information about being able to segment sounds in words, whereas recoding the word speaks to blending sounds. Then we have our word reading fluency assessment. And this is essentially a list of both regular and irregular words out of context. So you're assessing students' decoding skills without additional um, content for them to be able to try and figure out the meaning of the word. And then the last assessment that we have that kind of reflects that phonics skill is your ORF accuracy assessment. Because again, you're um, able to evaluate how students are decoding words within text during that timed oral reading fluency assessment. So the slide that we have here is our North Carolina beginning of year data for first graders for this school year. This is just an example of how you can use the comparing measures report to pull data for specific assessments that we just discussed to get a broad idea of where your students stand for their phonics skills. I chose first grade because it does have all of the assessments that are associated with phonics and I also included PSF, the phoneme segmentation fluency, because it is a precursor to phonics skill. And what this data tells us is that we really need to ensure that we're looking at providing explicit and systematic phonics instruction in our core. And it's a nod back to those questions about using data to make decisions at, decisions at the district and school level. Um, we need to think about if our instruction is working for students, and we can frame the level of risk a student is at 
and the appropriate level of support that they need within this data. Students who fall in the blue and green bands are at negligible or minimal risk, and strong core instruction should be appropriate support for them. Students who fall in the yellow band are at some risk and need strategic support, and students who are represented in the red band are identified as at risk and need intensive support, which brings us back to those questions. Who needs help? What kind of help do they need? Is it helping? And if not, what needs to change? And so it's that ongoing use of data and progress monitoring and teaming structures that you have in place to use this data to provide the critical support that we need for students. And then finally, while Dibbles gives us some good information to start, you might need to dig a little deeper. This is the letters, phonics, and word reading survey tool that all your teachers have access to in letters content. It's a really good tool for students who you're considering moving from supplemental to intensive interventions when they're not making progress, it allows you to um, assess them very, fairly quickly. And um, you can pick out specific corresponding patterns between what students already know and what they need to know. It ha it's most appropriate for use later kindergarten and moving forward. And then the assessments increase in difficulty, so you're really measuring what kids can do, but they can also be discontinued when they become frustrational. All right, so we're on the home stretch. Um, if you guys can hang with me for about 10 more minutes, we're going to wrap it up. So we know that effective implementation takes time and it's challenging and it's critically important that we have systems and structures in place that will support our educators. Um, one of those systems that we have in place is, of course, letters and letters professional development is going to be the support that we're going to highlight today. Uh, volume one of letters will address that word recognition side of the reading rope. You can see that at the top of the blue portion. And then volume two or year two for teachers will highlight the language comprehension portion of the rope. Um, so today, since we're talking about phonics, phonics within letters is going to be within unit three, which is beginning phonics, word recognition and spelling, and unit four, advanced decoding, spelling, and word recognition. So last time, um, Angela and Donna highlighted the letters PLC guide. It looks like about 30% of you guys, based on the um, initial poll, have already checked this out and used this resource, which is awesome. So we're only going to take just a few minutes to highlight that resource, but we're really going to spend more time on the awesome resources that are embedded within the PLC guide today. So if you haven't already, if you will, um, in the chat bar, um, Angela or Cynthia, one of them will drop a link to the PLC guide if you'll open that. And this is for volume one. Um, unit three is going to be on a, around page 11 and 12. It kind of starts on one page and goes to the other. So if you'll scroll down to find unit three. And I just want to take a second to highlight the three major components of the PLC guide. So I will say this guide was designed for an extended PLC, a 90 minute PLC. And we know that that's not always um, possible with scheduling. So if you don't have that extended time, feel free to use this kind of like a choice board. What's going to be best for your district or your school? Um, the three components, the first one is going to be the overview of learning. That first section that will be highlighted in yellow. Um, that's going to be exactly like it sounds. It's going to overview content for either three or four sessions, depending on the unit. The second section is going to be your bridge to practice section. Within this section, educators and coaches can discuss Bridge to, act, bridge to practice activities. Um, we have highlighted ones for each section, but again, if this is not what your school or district needs, you can always highlight different ones during that portion of the PLC. And the final portion to the right is the application and coaching for all. And this section is going to be opportunities for practicing new concepts or modeling new concepts or even watching videos where we've linked teachers or sometimes it's our Office of Early Learning staff modeling for you. Um, this can be uh, facilitated by a coach, by a teacher, by a school leader, but it's just opportunities for practice. So um, just for time's sake, we're not going to set the two-minute timer, but just take a moment to reflect how might this PLC guide be a helpful support to you and your district, your school, your uh, classroom for you guys that are teachers, and think about how you might use this in the future. And again, we had you guys scroll down to Unit 3, but if your school or district's at a different a point, maybe you're in unit four, maybe you're, you're in unit two, um, take a look at those sections and see how this might support you. All right, so one tool I really do want to take some time to dive into today in our last few minutes is the self-reflection tool. So if you'll click to the next slide, um, 
there are so many amazing resources linked within the PLC guide, but my personal favorite resource are the self-reflection tools. Um, the one for phonics is going to be, uh, you can see the arrow pointed right there on page 14. There are also self-reflection tools for phonological awareness, for fluency, comprehension, vocabulary, and they're just like they're, they sound. They are a way for you as either a leader, a coach, a teacher to self-reflect. Think about your knowledge of phonics and um, how you can learn and grow as a leader or an educator. So we'll drop that direct link to the tool in the chat bar if you can't find it on page 14. And while we're doing that, I just want to talk about the purpose of these tools. So they're support. So they're non-evaluative. They're not meant to be a walkthrough tool where you evaluate a teacher. They're to eval evaluate your professional understanding um, and for you to reflect on those instructional practices and determine alignment with our state rollout of letters professional learning. It's also a way for you to determine where you are in your learning and your next steps, maybe, maybe more professional learning or coaching, and it's also a record of professional growth over time. So Louisa Motes, she's one of the authors of letters, um, along with Carol Tolman, but Louisa Motes says that teaching reading is rocket science, and she's exactly right. It is a job for an expert. Moreover, teaching reading requires considerable knowledge and skill acquired over several years. Years is so important right there. So we know that this is a, a long process. We don't expect you to be masters overnight or experts. And it's through focused study and supervised practice. So no one can develop this expertise by one or two college courses or one or two letter sessions or attending a few one-shot in-service workshops. However, as a principal or a leader in your school, you're the one that can offer the teachers that invaluable feedback as they practice correctly. And with your role is that responsibility to be well-versed in what evidence-based reading instruction looks like and sounds like in a classroom. So these self-reflection tools were designed for that, to help you build your understanding, to help you evaluate your knowledge and your understanding, and also to calibrate your understanding of what evidence-based reading instruction looks like. So not for evaluating the teachers, they're built for you. If you'll open the tool, we haven't had a chance already, and I want you just to skim that first column right now. So the first column where it says letters, instructional guidance, what we teach. So the one you have open is just phonics. So if you skim down that first column, take a look at these best practices that we've identified and just familiarize yourself with that first column. All right, hopefully you've had time to at least skim to familiarize yourself. The other components of the self-reflection tool include um, explicit instruction, and you'll see that there are, are multiple places where it says visit one, visit two. That would be where you go and if you saw it in action in a classroom, how did you feel? How was your content knowledge? How did you, um, did you understand like maybe there were some terms on here that you need to clarify or have more professional learning on? So it's more for a um, best practice look for. So for the sake of time, we're not going to include the video today, but we will link it on the Padlet. Um, if you'd like to go and practice with the classroom that we have here, you can. Um, and you would just use the, the classroom. This particular video has a lot of examples. She's going to connect phonemic awareness to phonics instruction. Um, she's also going to practice blending sounds into words and eventually phrases and sentences. But there are a lot of things that you could look down that best practice list and identify. So just think, um, our next one is on our, your note catcher. And again, we want you guys to get out of here on time. So self-reflect, um, how might this tool be helpful to you as a district leader, as a coach, as a teacher, um, and how, who might you share this with? Maybe there's someone in your building that this might be very helpful. Maybe your understanding of all of these best practices is very strong. However, you can think of a colleague that it might be able, um, a great support for. So just think a minute for um, how you might use this tool. All right, so as we've discussed over the last two sessions, a principal is the, of the school is the literacy leader. And with an implementation team, you have that ability to lead improvement for literacy outcomes. That's always our goal in this formula. Um, that enabling context, that team that we've talked about, many of you have started your implementation team, but, but a few of you um, identified on our first poll that you haven't. So that's one challenge that we, or one task that we leave you with is to think about your literacy team. How can you support your building and help them through this process of literacy, improved literacy outcomes? One tool we've shared in the past is the, the ALF. 
which is the Administrator's Literacy Framework Guide. If you haven't had a chance to look at that, again, it's going to be linked on our palette. This is a great tool to share with your literacy teams as you begin to plan and move forward with next steps for improvement. All right, final challenge for you. Um, these are just things we leave you with as I hope that you will go out and try in your districts and your school. We hope that you'll try that, that phonics self-reflection tool and reflect on your current knowledge. We didn't have a lot of time to do that within the webinar, but hopefully you'll have the time later to go back and do that. Think about your beginning of the year M-Class data. Kelly shared slides from the state for first grade. How does your school or your district compare to that state data in first grade? What big wins do you see or what areas of improvement or focus do you have for your literacy um, within your building in your district this year? And finally, if you haven't had a chance, please connect with your literacy team and continue to review those remaining components or start that ALF tool to improve those outcomes. Um, our Padlet, everything we linked today, which I know was a lot of information, will always be linked in the Padlet along with the last two webinars. We'll continue to add to, to this. So if you missed the last two and you want to go back and watch those recordings or see those resources, they'll always be there for you. Feel free to share that with your colleagues. Um, next time in our next session, we will move along to vocabulary. And if you haven't had a chance to register for that, we will drop that link one more time in the chat bar. You do have to register for each webinar separately. So vocabulary and then fluency and comprehension will be our final session in March. Um, many of you in the feedback last time asked about pre-K. And we actually do have a pre-K webinar series offered by Office of Early Learning. And if you're interested, they have two offerings for the month. One is during um, midday and one is later afternoon. A repeat of two sessions within that same month with whichever one works better for your schedule. Feel free to share that with your pre-K leaders if they're not here in the webinar with you or your pre-K teachers and coaches. And we thank you. Um, we are the Office of Early Learning. Feel free to reach out to us or contact us. We can always connect you with your consultant in your region if we happen to not be in your region. And we're always happy to answer questions or support you in any way that we can. And we thank you for coming today and, and spending a, a little bit of your day with us.